Here are some lyrics from the song called Brave by Sarah B. I don't know how to pronounce her last name, so I'm not going to try. Here are the lyrics. You can be amazing. You can turn a phrase into a weapon or a drug. You can be the outcast or be the backlash of somebody's lack of love. Or you can start speaking up. Nothing's going to hurt you the way that words do when they settle neath your skin, kept on the inside and no sunlight. Something's a shadow wins. But I wonder what would happen if you say what you want to say and let the words fall out. Honestly, I want to see you be brave with what you want to say. Growing up in a cult complicates everything. The truth matters. The truth sets us free. You're listening to Out of the Shadows with Mary Murphy. Today is December 26th, 2022, and this episode is quite late. My apologies, and I am not in a place where I can really share a lot about all the details of why it's so late. Hopefully someday I will be able to, but I really appreciate your patience as you waited all this time, and I hope that your days have been lovely. So this is the episode part two of Becoming Mary, and what do I want to say? Well, this song has really been inspirational to me in these last weeks, and has really motivated me to jump ahead and take a look back, and to say what I want to say. So here goes. Dr. Dodie Murphy, my bio dad, was a narcissist, sociopath monster who was the personification of evil on this earth. As I said in my video posted on my blog in January of this year, many people say Dodie helped them, saved their lives even. Those are their stories, and in no way whatsoever does any of that wipe out or diminish the truth that Dodie was an evil man, a monster. This is not a scale to weigh how much good versus how much bad he did. To commit the kind of atrocities and crimes that Doty did commit, how in the world can anything he did be deemed good? What a facade. A worthless, empty, whitewashed facade. I am not the only victim of Doty's sexual crimes. What else do I want to say? I want to tell you about a conversation I had with Gay Wheat in May 2008. I was 26, and Dodie had recently kicked me out of his house. Now a little background on Gay Wheat. She was married to Dr. Ed Wheat, a a medical doctor in Springdale, Arkansas, where he grew up, and the author of Intended for Pleasure. And we'll talk about that book, Intended for Pleasure, some other time, because there's a lot to say about that. Dr. Wheat actually put two or three stitches in my lip when I was about 18 months old. So my bio parents have been close to the Wheats and their extended family for over 40 years. Dr. Wheat is the elder emeritus at the church where I grew up because he helped to start the church. And on that note, I want to clarify that the cult in which I grew up, the Institute in Basic Life Principles, is not a church. Let me say that again. Bill Gothard's Institute in Basic Life Principles or IBLP, is not a church. It is known as a non-denominational religious organization or ministry. This is very, very important. The media and anyone who calls IBLP a church is incorrect. It's very important to understand what IBLP is and is not, because calling IBLP a church severely diminishes the extent and reach which it had and has currently into facets of life and the four corners of the world. IBLP is a non-denominational religious organization, not a church. In fact, it's an authoritarian religious cult. There were groups of people adhering to IBLP beliefs that formed themselves into churches to be with what they would call like-minded people. But IBLP itself is not a church, so please don't limit it by calling it a church. Let's be accurate with the words we use. Now that I made it clear, IBLP is not a church, let's go back to Gay Wheat. When I was engaged to be married in the arranged marriage in 2008, Gay Wheat was going to host the church's bridal shower for me at her home. This was a huge deal. 
Usually, Gay did not attend bridal showers, but she really wanted to host mine, which was an incredible honor. I respected her, looked up to her, and she had been very supportive and encouraging to me. However, after Dodie kicked me out, I was trying to figure out how to survive and trying to arrange and figure out all the basic life things necessary to survive on my own and for which I was sorely unprepared. On this particular day in May 2008, I called Gay. She had a three-car garage and she had let me park my minivan in one of them when my bio parents and I stayed with her for several weeks five years earlier. I called Gay and asked if she would be willing to temporarily let me put my stuff in one of the garage stalls in order to go through it and while I was looking for a place to live. Her answer blew me away. Her tone blew me away. She said that she was not sure and that she needed to speak to my bio dad before she could make a decision and give me any answer. I was 26 years old. 26. I told her that if she called Dodie, that he would just tell her that I was a rebellious daughter. She did not even ask me why or for any other information. She just said she needed to talk to him and couldn't give me an answer until she did. I basically withdrew my request and thanked her and hung up. I was shocked. And now, 14 and a half years later, reflecting on the conversation, I feel sadness. And yet, this brief conversation is a window into so much more, which we're not going to dive into at the moment, because there's more I want to say. I want to tell you about the constant pressure from people in Northwest Arkansas and around the world during the 18 months I stayed in Arkansas after Dodie kicked me out. One of my mentors told me to keep my mouth shut because if I tried to defend myself, if I tried to tell my side of the story, that the mud I was throwing, in other words, the truth telling was being called and likened to throwing mud. The mud would leave dirt on my hands too, making me look guilty too. I'm still processing that advice and that analogy. Um, however, it just doesn't sit well. Everyone in Northwest Arkansas kept telling me what wonderful people my bio parents were, etc., 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 blah, blah, blah. The stalking, the slander, the myriad of stories I heard about myself, the anonymous letters I received mailed from different parts of the country, the letters taped to my door late at night, the emails, the Facebook messages, the accusations that came pouring in from around the world, the pressure to get back in line and comply and submit to Doty was immense and constant. Then I moved 1,800 miles away. Thank God. For the next five years, I received on average one Facebook message or text or call or handwritten letter filled with accusations, admonitions, and calling me to repent for being a rebellious daughter and dishonoring my parents every week. Every week, sometimes multiple times per week, for five more years. Some of the messages and letters were from cult members, and some were not. My bio dad had quite the following himself. In fact, his funeral was three and a half hours long. What in the world? I did not attend. However, I did watch segments of it as it was streamed online. Let me be frank. I did not want to attend Dodie's funeral. And there's no way I would have sat in person through three and a half hours of people praising Dodie, because that's exactly what it was. And my bio family did not want me there. Dodie disowned me, disinherited me. I was shocked the bio family decided to include me in the obituary list. Even though it's a legal document, even a legal record, that's how disowned I am. My sources confirmed they were also surprised my name ended up being included in the obituary. Of course, it would have been too obvious and would have seriously hurt the facade of perfection to leave me out of the obituary. I chose truth, chose to speak truth, and the cost was and is very high. Don't ever presume that you know or have an inkling of what anyone goes through when they choose to step forward and tell the truth and call out crimes. Keep your mouth shut and believe them. 
let's go back to the continual outpouring of telling me I am wrong and need to repent. So the weekly, or more frequent even, messages lasted five years after I left Arkansas, which put it at six and a half years after Doty kicked me out of his house. But the letters and messages did not stop then. I still received one or two on average per month for the next four years, which made it over 10 years since Doty kicked me out. A whole decade. People have a lot of opinions and a lot of free time, apparently. The continual barrage also demonstrates how much pressure that Doty kept putting out to keep the topic on the minds of these people and how motivated he was to do so. Enough so, enough pressure to motivate these people to write me or call me or approach me, and some efforts were in person. In fact, over breakfast one snowy day in Virginia, one lady, the wife of a former director of another cult compound from the cult days, asked me in 2016 about my contact with my bio parents. I told her I didn't have contact with them. Her words and reply felt like a knife in my heart. She said, quote, I hoped when you became a parent that you would have more understanding toward your parents, end quote. I was speechless. The truth is, becoming a parent opened my eyes exponentially. I was almost 34 years old at the time. I was a mom, and yet in the perspective of the cult, I was still considered a rebellious daughter, a child, even though I was a grown woman, an adult. Let me say that again. I was 34 years old, a mom, and in the perspective of the cult, they still considered me as a rebellious daughter, a rebellious child, not an adult at all. So since then, it's been 14 and a half years, the messages have not stopped, nor have the hurtful responses or the hurtful lack of responses to my stepping forward to tell my story, to tell the truth of what I survived. In the winter of 2019, I was living in Arizona and made a quick trip back to Arkansas for a funeral. The funeral was held in the church in which I grew up. After the funeral, I was talking with many people, as one does at a funeral, many of whom I had not seen in close to 10 years when I left Arkansas the first time. However, it was the first time I had been back to Arkansas after I made the report to law enforcement six months earlier about the crimes that my bio dad, Doty Murphy, perpetrated against me. In a whirlwind of activity, I found myself all of a sudden standing in a small circle with two men and one woman. One of the men I've known my whole life and was very close to his family for a lot of years. The other man and the woman I knew quite well. All three were adults when I was growing up. However, at the time of this conversation, I was 36 years old. One of them asked me about my bio parents and why I was not seeing them or speaking to them. I remember the moment as if it happened in slow motion. I looked at one person, then the second, then the third, with so many thoughts racing through my head, the main one being, oh my gosh, I guess we're going to talk about this right here. I said matter-of-factly that my dad sexually abused me when I was growing up. The man whose family I had been so close to, without blinking, without pausing or anything, replied, quote, I don't want to take sides, end quote. I remember saying that I wasn't asking anyone to take sides. I wasn't. You asked me a question and I answered it. And in reflecting and processing the conversation and the immediate response of I don't want to take sides, I realized there was no shock, no horror, no compassion, no sympathy. I just told you, my dad sexually abused me, and your only response is that you don't want to take sides. Sexually abusing a child is a crime in the laws of the state of Arkansas and in the United States of America. You also call yourself a Christian. What does God have to say about people who hurt children? I believe God takes sides. 
He's very clear. Oh, and on that note, not taking a side actually is a choice. You just sided with evil. So fast forward two and a half more years to December 2021. I did not go to Dodie's funeral in November 2021, as I've made clear. I did not want to attend. I was not welcome at the funeral, and I was not wanted at the funeral. I traveled back to Arkansas in December. I spent time with my sister, with good friends, my bonus family, and I also went to Dodie's grave, which I will talk about another time. During that trip, I went to a couple of services at the church where I grew up. It was a big deal for me to go back, and it also meant facing these people, specifically about a dozen people, who are very outspoken and supportive of my bio dad. I'm not scared of these people, and it's also hard when people do not believe me, question my mental health, call me a liar, and much more. I'm human. It's hard. The responses to my unexpected presence was quite revealing. One person refused not only to say hello, but literally turned around and walked in the opposite direction any time they saw me. I walked up to where my good friend was talking to another person, and that person completely ignored me 100%. So I finally walked away. And then that person had all kinds of questions with which to pepper my good friend about me. Such as, was I in town because I knew my family was out of town? Etc., etc., etc. Quite the list of questions. But at another time, that same person planted themselves in my way when my daughter was by my side. Hmm, really? I see through your facade. I see through your act and your pretending. Another man who had been vocal about my blog post and my speaking out, and not in a positive or supportive way, would not say anything to my face about it. I even had lunch with that family, and the brief moment one of them made a comment about another former cult member and the marriage in which a female entered. And I explained that it was actually an arranged marriage, and then gave the timeline about my planned arranged marriage in 2008. They couldn't even hear it. The man made jokes about arranging a marriage for his adult kids and spent most of the rest of the time in the kitchen. The woman asked me why I was so much more affected by everything than my older siblings, making me feel blamed, and I don't accept the blame or the shame. I am very sad. These were such dear people to me. And yet they also treated me as a child. I am not a child. I'm a, I'm an adult. And if you'll talk behind my back but won't say things to my face, then that's very telling too and very disappointing. I ran into another lady that I've adored since I was very young in the bathroom at church. Her question, quote, you know we love you, right? End quote, struck a strange chord with me. Turns out she and her family were Team Doty despite knowing I stepped forward about the sexual abuse he perpetrated against me. So I'm not quite sure how the two can be both true. How can you disbelieve me, yet not even ask me anything at all, side with Dodie, and somehow I am supposed to know and feel that you love me? That is so illogical and ridiculous, quite the contradiction. Which brings me back to the man who claimed he didn't want to take sides back in 2019. You know, the conversation after the funeral. Well, as time reveals truth, so his choice to stand with Dodie was quite evident in 2021. This man was very vocal to other people before my visit and during my visit to Arkansas, and his anger toward me was palpable. It's not my responsibility to make people listen or believe truth or even make them have a conversation with me, not my job. These are just a handful of examples from last December and the past 14 and a half years, a handful of many. I hope that sharing them provides a glimpse into the pressure survivors face, the astounding links with which abusers will go to to circle the wagons against the victims, 
with the help of the flying monkeys, as I call them, who are quite busy protecting the abuser. Knowing each one of these people, and so many more, makes me so sad that they chose to side with evil. I do not understand brushing off a victim of child sexual abuse to favor the perpetrator. To protect the perpetrator. Why and how does one do this? Obviously, to me, their actions scream from the rooftops that they are not safe for victims of abuse. I do not understand the logic because there is no logic. What do you gain from standing with Doty? Free medical care? Why do you not want to sexual abuse victims to be supported? Why do you want to support someone accused of sexual abuse of children? Why don't you want to talk about sexual abuse? Are you hiding something? And many have questioned, well, why didn't you come forward earlier? Why didn't you say something earlier? Well, most of these people were adults when I was a child. And their responses show me that they're not safe now. And had I approached them when I was a child or even a teenager, what would they have, what would their response have been? Would they have protected me? Would they have believed me? Would they have gone straight to Dodie and told him? Or what would have happened? And just thinking about that is terrifying to me. And obviously, it would not have gone well. I mean, they can't even believe me or have a conversation with me as an adult. So why would they believe me as a child? And on that note, and yes, I'm very passionate about this because there are a lot of children who need to be protected and it's not okay, not okay to not protect children. So on that note, if you're not going to protect children and you're going to claim the name of Jesus, if you're going to say that you're a Christian but not protect children and not stand against child abuse, child sexual abuse crimes, then I would I say that you are causing children to doubt God because how can they feel safe and feel that God is safe? And feel like God loves them when they're being treated in this horrendous manner and not being protected by people who claim the name of Jesus and do it all in God's name. So the abuse is per perpetrated in God's name. The victims are blamed in God's name, saying that they tempted the perpetrator as children, as teenagers, whatever age the victims were. Such a bunch of lies. And then others live and act in such a way to cover up, to excuse the crimes, to dismiss the crimes, and they do it in God's name too. So, wow. That's living in a way that takes God's name in vain. Shame on all of you. And this is not even going into the death threats, the extent of the stalking, the lawsuit threats, the shunnings, and so much more that I've personally experienced in the last 14 and a half years because of speaking truth and standing against evil. As I've started to speak more publicly, other people have trusted me with their stories too. I'm not alone in facing an onslaught of efforts and further abuse and retaliation for speaking truth and calling out crimes against children and against humans, and specifically against females. And just this little glimpse of my story and what I faced, such a small glimpse, guys, such a small glimpse. I hope that you'll keep in mind the prestige that my bio dad had within the cult, how close he is, how close he was to Bill Gothard, 
as a director of the cult compound, the favorite cult compound of Gothard's, that for example, um, many ask, why aren't the Duggar kids leaving? The adult Duggars. <laughs> the adult Duggars. They're not just kids. Um, why aren't they leaving? Why aren't they, you know, turning away from all of this? Why aren't they calling out, speaking up? Guys, the, what I have experienced is exponentially magnified because they are reality TV stars, because they were put on that stage in that spotlight since they were tiny, some since they were born. So I cannot imagine what they face. You cannot imagine what they face. Leave them alone. Seriously. Just saying. So all survivors face a lot of things. A lot of retribution. A lot, a lot of pressure. Choosing truth is not easy or pain-free. It's costly and lonely. The truth matters. The truth sets us free. My name is Mary, and I choose truth. Thanks for listening. I remember to click subscribe and follow me on Instagram and YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts at Out of the Shadows with Mary Murphy. The next episode drops on the 31st. Yes, this week. Check out my Instagram, Out of the Shadows with Mary Murphy, over the next three days to see how you can participate in the last podcast episode of 2022. Thanks for listening. Wishing you and yours much happiness and peace during this holiday season. To other victims and survivors of all types of abuse and trauma, you are not alone. I know the holidays are hard. I see you. To those still standing in the shadows, I see you in the silence, in the darkness. You matter. Hope you have a gentle holiday season. Now you've heard me let the words fall out as I say what I want to say as I am brave. Check out the song Brave. It's phenomenal. And come join the conversation on Instagram at Out of the Shadows with Mary Murphy. Or send me a message on my website, which is um, www.outoftheshadowswithmarymurphy.com. Till next time, friends. Ciao.